Happy New Year, everybody. This must be the service where everybody stayed up super late. <laughs> you guys are the party animals. I'm John. I'm the student pastor here. If you're a guest or new here this morning, I want to apologize. It's National Youth Pastor Gets to Preach Day, so you get me. Uh, it's usually the Sunday after Christmas or the Sunday after Easter, the youth guy gets to preach in big church. Uh, and today is student takeover, so we have students serving all over. This morning they uh, led worship uh, with France. They were in the kitchen greeting, all that fun stuff. Uh, and it's also family Sunday, so all the kids that are normally back in kids' ministry, welcome to big church. Glad you guys are in here. Dang, you guys are super quiet. For You guys must have stayed up partying all night. All right, so before we begin, I want to kick us off with a game. So I need two volunteers. Again, kids and students, raise their hands. Actually, we're not going to play a game. So I know, super disappointing. Super disappointing. You should have been in here in first service when I said that. Everybody just sat on their hands. They're like, not me. I don't, no, no. Uh, so uh, like I said, Today is student takeover, and so before we dive in this morning, I want to talk a little bit about Wednesday nights and student ministry stuff, uh, and kind of what we do and why we do it. So on any given Wednesday, we can have anywhere from 50 to 80 students here, uh, and we average like 60, 65 most Wednesdays, and probably 60% of those students don't go to church on Sundays. The majority of them, probably 90% of them, they just they're just unchurched. Um, and so they come and hang out with their friends on Wednesdays, which I'm cool with. That's cool. At least they're getting God's word because God's word does not return void. Uh, and then, uh, so the national average for student ministry youth group attendance is like 8 to 10% of a church attendance, like a whole church attendance. Currently at Valley View, we're probably sitting at 20%, uh, which is awesome. Uh, and some of that, I believe, is because of you guys and your generosity to donate when we have fundraisers when we, and help send, send kids to camp. Uh, and our mission in the student ministry is to help kids own their faith and stick to it. And I'm talking about their faith, not their parents' faith, but their faith. They're at a time in their lives when they're trying to figure out what they believe and why they believe it. So our mission is to help foster that and help grow their faith. Uh, and helping students stick to their faith can be a challenge. Uh, current stats suggest that anywhere from 70 to 80% of students, when they graduate high school, will walk away from their faith. And I believe some of that is because the church, I'm not just talking about Valley View, I'm talking about the whole church has separated kids and students from the whole church. We're not all sitting at the same table. We aren't all being part of the, the same body. And this is one reason why we don't do anything for students on Sunday morning. Instead, we encourage them to sit with their families and their friends and to serve. So those of you in kids' ministry, once you hit sixth grade, Sorry, there's no more kids' church. You get to sit in big church. And you can have some fun on Wednesday nights and come and play games with me and the rest of the kids, the students. So we encourage them to serve on Sunday mornings. We actually have a lot of students who serve on a regular basis on Sunday mornings, whether helping out with kids' church, not just in the nursery, but helping lead worship, emceeing, teaching, we have kids that are constantly replacing all the prepackaged communion in here and helping set up communion. We have students who are helping run cameras and slides on a weekly basis. My point is, is that the church needs to stop separating tables. I saw a stat that says 70% of Christians accepted Jesus before they turned 18. 
so if that's truly the case, then we all need to be sitting together at the same table. We all need to be part of the body of Christ. When I was growing up during the holidays, especially Thanksgiving and Christmas, there would be two tables for dinner, right? The kids' table and the adults' table. But when you get to be a teenager, you start to wonder, when do I get to go sit at the adults' table? Because I'm tired of hanging out with the five-year-olds. No offense, five-year-old, you're cool, you have your own thing. I have a couple of, I have a five-year-old, okay? He's a, he's fun. I also have a two-year-old who likes to like, we call her a mini tornado, so. And I believe that's what's going on in the church, especially the American church, right? We have two separate tables. We have kids ministry and student ministry, and then we have big church, right? But what happens when kids grow out of student ministry and out of youth Bible study? They want more. They want to go deeper in their faith. They want to experience a shared identity with the church. But when they go check out the adult table, they're told, it's not your time yet. You're the future of the church. They quickly realize that they don't have a place there. So what do you do when you don't have a place at the table? You leave the meal. This is why teenagers are leaving the church at an alarming rate. And you know who suffers as a result? The church suffers. Because all of a sudden, the church is missing something that it needs. It's missing the gifts and the talents of young people. It's missing the passion and the willingness of young adults. At some point, we need to ask ourselves, are two separate tables working? We need to ask ourselves, are we not all part of the same body? So my question to you is this this morning. What would the church look like if we actually lived that out? if we all sat at the same table, if we were all part of the same body. And I'm not just talking about students here. I'm talking about everybody being included. Every follower of Jesus being treated like they are part of the body of Christ. The youth are not the future of the church. They are the church. So are the kids. So are you and I. Everyone who is a follower of Jesus is the church. We are all part of the body of Christ. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning, starting in verse 12. That's page 959 in the Bibles in the seats in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that one and mark it up. We want everybody to have access to God's Word. and You can consider that a gift from us. And what we're going to be talking about today is that we are a diverse community of believers. But at the same time, we are unified because of Jesus. And what Paul does here in these verses is he joins his doctrine of gifts with his doctrine of the body of Christ. So let's dive in, starting in verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members... And all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So this is a, a great illustration of the human body and relating it to the workings of the community of Christians. You see, every cell in the human body is linked by a common DNA code. Yet the parts of our bodies, they look different. They do different things. They accomplish different things. We even treat them different. And the same can be said about the followers of Jesus. We all have the, a common DNA code. We all look differently, unless you're a twin. 
we all work differently. We all accomplish different things. We all have different gifts. And during this time in the Corinthian church, they had created artificial dividing lines. Jews, Greeks, slaves, free. Sounds a lot like the American church creating artificial dividing lines with race, political party, age. But none of that matters because we are all in one body, all in one spirit. Those of us that follow Jesus are unified despite our diversity. Even when we all look different or we accomplish different things, we all have a common DNA, a common goal. Verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would, make, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would make it not any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Diversity is no accident tribute of the body. It is of its very essence. No member is to be equated with the body. It takes many members to make up a body. And in Corinth at the time, there were some people that felt unwanted or less of themselves because they didn't have a certain gift. Kind of sounds familiar a little bit in the American church because we tend to glorify people who have certain gifts and making people who have different gifts feel unwanted or unworthy. And then therefore, those people tend to withdraw from the body because they feel like they're unwanted or unneeded. When a member of the body says, I don't belong to the body, then the body itself is incomplete. And so the detached member does not benefit being apart from the body. Too many believers are detached from the church, unwilling to commit to being fully functioning members. And as a result, both the believer and the church lose out. They lose out on the blessings that God intended for them. It's kind of like a light bulb that's not plugged in. It's just sitting there taking up space, providing no benefit, just hanging out. Not shining. But when the light bulb is plugged in, it's providing light. It's shining. If you aren't plugged into your local church, is your light shining? Paul talks about here people who feel excluded from the body. It is if some of the Corinthian Christians said, I don't have a certain spiritual gift, so I'm not part of the body of Christ. After all, hands and eyes have more important and more glamorous roles than feet and ears do. So Paul wants these Christians who feel like they're excluded to know that they are part of the body of Christ. Have you ever felt like you weren't part of the body because you didn't have a certain gift? Yet, the same principle can be say, stated toward those who want to exclude people, exclude others from the body. Paul could have just as well said, the hand cannot say to the foot that it is not of the body because it is not a hand. Paul wants Christians who might exclude others 
because they don't appreciate their place in the body and to recognize the fact of unity. We're all unified. Have you ever excluded somebody because they don't have a certain gift or they don't look like you? My guess is that we all have, whether intentional or not. We've excluded people. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? Not only is the diversity of the body of Christ acceptable, but it's essential. The body cannot work properly if all our hands or all our eyes. The body must have different parts and different gifts or it would not work together effectively as a body. No member of the body is more important than any other member. Verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. No part of the body can say to another part, I don't need you. Every part of the body is necessary. Pride can sneak in here a little bit and tempt people because maybe you don't see what other people are doing within the body. You're like, you know what? We don't need them. I'll do it by myself. I don't see what they're doing anyways. This kind of happens to our own body, like our actual physical bodies. We think that we have a body part that is weaker than other body parts or of lower imp- low importance until it gets hurt. For me, that's my left thumb. I don't pay attention to that sucker very much until it's hurt, and then I can't do, do normal, simple stuff with it. Then we realize how important it really is. The hand or the eye may seem more important and have more glamour in its position, but it's not more necessary or more important than any of the other body parts. Brandon is not more important than Dee Dee and Dylan. And they're usually helping out in between services, setting up communion. Just because you don't see them doesn't mean that they aren't doing something important for the body. We often place too much emphasis on members and ministry that are visible. But this, is, this wrongly equates visibility with value. Not every member has the same gift or the same role or the same level of responsibility, but every m- member matters. Those who ministries go behind the scenes are vital to the life of the church, to the health of the church. Verse 23, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the great honor and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. With our more presentable parts do not require, but God has so composed the body, giving great, greater honor to the part that has lacked it. The parts of our bodies that are normally covered with clothes are considered less honorable. But we give them great honor by clothing them. If somebody feels that they are hidden or are unglamorous member of the body, God knows how to bestow honor upon them. Verse 25. That there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Since God is the author and source of unity among believers, he obviously supplies the church with those things necessary for unity. In light of the necessity of every body part, there should be no division in the church so that every member has the same concern with each other. 
How often are we divided as a church? Whether we're divided by our age or our political parties or the church coffee or what ministry gets more exposure or by our favorite sports teams. If every member is needed, then we ought to be concerned with every other member when they're suffering or when they're going through something or when they're not living like a Christ follower should. This is why Scripture places so much emphasis on caring and loving one another. We are responsible to and accountable for one another because we all share the same DNA code, the same goal. Your pinky toe may seem insignificant, right? Until you stub it. And it shuts your whole body down. You're writhing in pain. You can't walk. You can't do anything. If one member of the body suffers, all members suffer together. And if one member is honored, we all rejoice together. So don't only be concerned with your own needs, but be concerned with those within Christ's body. This is just simply an application of the second greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Here's my bottom line for you guys this morning. For the church to thrive, every member needs to be part of the body. What happens to the body if a part is missing? Can it exist? Yeah, sure. Can it function? Yeah, it can function. Can it accomplish good things? Yes. But can it thrive? Not like God intended it to. So here's a few ways that you can own this and apply it to your life. Find your part to play and embrace it. What body part are you? God is calling all of us to be part of the body to help the church thrive. And as I mentioned earlier, when members are detached from the church, they miss out on the blessings that God has intended for them. You never know what God has for you and what you could be missing out on. I was there. I was that detached, uncommitted member. I was like the light bulb, not plugged in, just taking up space, providing no benefit. And then once I got plugged in, the blessings that God has given me through the people I've been around has been a vital part of my walk with Jesus. Whether it was the encouragement I needed at the time or a a meal that my family needed at the time. God blessed me with those things because I was plugged in. Don't miss out on the blessing that God has for you because you're unwilling to be part of the body of Christ because you don't want to be plugged in. You don't want to be a plugged in light bulb. What gifts and talents do you have to contribute? God has prepared all of us with gifts and talents for him to use. We just have to be willing to let God use us. Where can you help the church thrive? Maybe that's helping out with kids and students. Maybe it's greeting. Maybe it's prepping for communion. Maybe it's serving in the kitchen. Maybe it's something behind the scenes. That's okay to be behind the scenes. Not everybody has to be on stage. In fact, I prefer not to be on stage. Whatever your part is, we would love to partner with you. If you need help figuring out what that is, we would love to have a conversation about that. 
Maybe your first step is becoming a follower of Jesus and becoming part of the body of Christ. We would love to talk to you about that too. So I've talked a lot about the church being like a body. I also talked about having two separate tables, a kid's table and an adult table. My next own it is this, pull the tables together. When two tables, the kid's table and the adult table, are split up at a family gathering, each table is missing out on something. Until that one crazy uncle who wants to be part of both experiences stands up and says, this isn't working! And he pulls the tables together, makes everybody stand up and move around. Kids are sitting with adults, adults are sitting with kids. And now suddenly, the teenagers get the best of both worlds. And nobody is missing out. Now I will say, Valley View does a pretty good job of pulling the tables together. But what does it look like to pull the tables together in church? It looks like kids bringing their laughter and their fun into times of worship, Family Sunday. Although I do say, I think we need to have game time on Sundays. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> it looks like teenagers and young adults serving alongside adults on worship teams and in the community. It looks like teenagers and young adults having a legitimate voice in the life of the church. Where else will these kids and teenagers learn about their history and their heritage? Where else will they experience a shared identity with the church, with the family? Now, will there be spills and messes? Yes, 100% of the time. And maybe some broken things. I.e. water dispenser. But how else do we grow? After the meal, what happens? Usually the kids go outside and play. The teenagers are probably hanging out with each other on the phone. Right, teenagers? But then we have the crazy uncle who wants to be part of both experiences. So he goes outside and plays. Maybe he pulls the teenagers off their phones and they go play football or something like that. He helps them grow. We need those crazy aunts and uncles to invest in the lives of young people. We need brave people who are willing to volunteer in children's and student ministries. Imagine what would happen if we had more crazies investing, intentionally investing into the lives of young people who pulled the tables together. They invited to serve with them and grow with them and learn with them and teach with them. My guess is, is that when that happens, the church, the church would not just exist. It wouldn't just function. It wouldn't just do good things the church would thrive. We are all part of the body of Christ. We are all sitting at the same table. Can you join me in prayer?